In today's video, we're going to talk about some of the top mistakes that players make in Baldur's Gate 3, and a lot of these actually come from my own experience. I do have a sponsor in today's video, but more on that in a little bit. Let's jump right into it. Mistake number one is using spells in combat that you could have activated before combat begins. For example, many wizards and sorcerers will use a spell called Mage Armor as it increases their armor class. If we take a look at the description of Mage Armor, it says, Until Long Rest which is telling you that after you cast it, Mage Armor will remain active on that character until they take a long rest, and then it has to be reapplied for the next day in game. This is a spell that you should get into the habit of casting immediately after you finish a long rest. And if you do that, you'll have it active at all times throughout that day, but even more importantly, you don't need to cast it in combat, which will use up your action for a turn when you could be slinging a powerful spell at an opponent. Other spells that are in a similar category to Mage Armor include Aid, which gives temporary hit points, and Long Strider, which gives an increase in movement speed. Before we get into mistake number two, though, I do have a message from today's welcome video sponsor, Factor. Too busy playing Baldur's Gate 3 to cook, clean, and clean up, and also not meeting your nutrition goals because of that? Yep, me too. And that's where Factor comes into play. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. All you gotta do is heat and enjoy. Seriously, just two minutes and you're good to get back to gaming. We all know how important it is to maintain healthy eating habits regardless of how busy you are or what games may be out. And Factor makes this possible by offering 34 plus weekly flavor packed dietitian approved meals. So there's something for everyone. As you can see right here, we have categories of protein plus, calorie smart, keto, vegan and veggie, chef's choice, and even dessert shakes and smoothies and extra proteins. I'm definitely guilty of being a little less physically active lately due to a certain game being out, so having calorie conscious items with meals with less than 550 calories per serving is absolutely perfect for me. Factor is my go-to solution when my job gets a little crazy and I'm trying to balance work with life and the time that it saves me is invaluable. So head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code WOLFHEART50 for 50% 50 off your first Factor box. That is factor75.com, code WOLFHEART50 for half off your first delicious box. Back to the video. Now, mistake number two is a little bit more advanced and it's also not a mistake always as sometimes it can't be avoided as many of the combat encounters in this game, you just can't predict that they will be combat encounters. But the ones that you can, let's say that you end up sneaking up to a group of bandits or monsters and you know that you have zero interest in attempting to socialize with them. Well, in Baldur's Gate 3, there are plenty of spells that will last for several turns. Instead of casting these spells in combat, you can actually cast many of these spells right before you initiate combat. And therefore, like with Mage Armor, you don't have to use your action on your first or second turn in combat to cast these spells. You can instead, you know, cast powerful spells that kill enemies. The tricky part here is that unlike Mage Armor, which stays active until a long rest, these spells do run out. For example, Bless is a spell that buffs your party, giving them an extra 1-4 to four bonus to their attack rolls and saving throws. In the spell's description for Bless, you can see that it lasts for 10 turns. So if you cast Bless and you're not in combat, that equates to one full minute of in-game time. So it's important not to cast it and then just stand around because it's going to go away. So yeah, you could cast Bless and then just immediately start combat mere seconds later. But an easier, less stressful way to do this is by entering into turn-based mode, which pauses time, and then you can cast your spells that you want to use that last multiple turns, and then initiate combat when you're ready. And since we just talked about Bless, which is a spell that requires concentration, that brings us into mistake number three, and that is not understanding what concentration spells are and overriding your concentration spells without realizing it. Each character in Baldur's Gate 3 can only concentrate on one concentration spell at a time. And if you look in a spell's description, it will tell you if it requires concentration. A big mistake that new players tend to make, and I used to do this all the time, is casting a concentration spell, and then on that character's next turn, casting another concentration spell without realizing that it overrides the first spell. So to get the max benefit out of most concentration spells, you should be keeping one of them active for several rounds of combat, and sometimes even the entire combat encounter if possible. For example, if I cast Bless with my Cleric, buffing my party members, and then on my next turn I cast Spirit Guardians, 
Well, the Bless spell didn't get much of a chance to really do hardly anything for my party as it's no longer active because my Cleric is now concentrating on Spirit Guardians. So know what concentration spells that you have in your arsenal, and when you use one, try to keep it active. Now, while you have a concentration spell active, you're free to cast spells that do not require concentration, and therefore you can be getting the benefit of two spells in a single round of combat. Also note that you can cancel a concentration spell by clicking on this little X mark in the bottom left of your character's portrait. And this can be really useful because sometimes if you have a certain spell that you're concentrating on that deals damage to anyone that is close to it, sometimes you might want to cancel this if there's no enemies in that area anymore so you don't run your own party members through that dangerous area. Mistake number four, and I'm absolutely guilty of this, is not using your new class features such as extra attack. So classes such as the Fighter, Ranger, Paladin, Monk, and Barbarian get a class feature called extra attack at level five. This makes it so that when they use the attack action on their turn, they can then do another attack on that same turn. And this can be very easy to forget about as there's no notification and you're probably in the habit of only doing one weapon attack per turn as this feature only becomes available at level 5 for the classes that get it. If you use a weapon attack and that weapon attack is not grayed out after you've used it one time in combat, you likely can use it again because you have extra attack. Missing out on the extra attack is missing out on one of the biggest power jumps that some of your more martial combat based characters will get. Mistake number five is ignoring companions. Now, of course, do whatever you want to do. This isn't necessarily a mistake for everyone, but it is important to note that if you are someone that wants to explore all of the content that a game offers, exploring your companions and spending the time to talk to them quite often will unlock a ton of new content and story for you. Forming some sort of relationship with your companions, even if that relationship is negative, will lead to a much more intense emotional game as Later down the line, there might be important decisions that come up and your companions are going to weigh in or they may even step in. You're going to feel much more behind that. After you do anything that's noteworthy in the story, it's usually a good idea to make your rounds at camp, speaking to all of your companions. Mistake number six is not inspecting your opponents. Now, in terms of what your opponent's armor class number is or what their ability scores are and how that affects your chances of landing attacks on them and having spells take effect on them, well, you don't really need to inspect your opponents to figure this out because when you target an opponent in BG3, Larian displays a percentage chance of success above their heads, which tells you how likely you are to land your attack or how likely it is that a spell will succeed in its intended effect against that opponent. When it comes to enemy resistances though, this is up to you to find out. Almost every opponent that I come up against, I will quickly right click on them, click on inspect, and then take a glance at the resistances category. If there's nothing showing here, then you really have nothing to worry about, but if there are damage types displayed here, that means that your opponent may be able to completely nullify incoming damage from certain damage types, they may take double the damage from certain damage types, or they may take half the damage of certain damage types. The skeleton, for example, we can see that there's a little red arrow pointing downwards, and this is telling us that bludgeoning damage against this particular opponent will do double the damage. So if you have any bludgeoning weapons, such as a mace or a hammer, whatever damage that you deal to that skeleton with strikes from those weapons will be doubled. That's a huge damage increase. Now each weapon and spell in this game will tell you what type of damage that it deals in its description. We can also see here that poison damage against this entity is nullified. So you definitely don't want to use poison or you're not really going to be doing much except wasting your turn. This spider right here has a blue and white arrow pointing upwards over the poison symbol. And this means that if you use poison on this spider, your damage will be halved. And that goes for poison from magical and physical. So the resistances category can be extremely useful and looking at it can sometimes be the difference between you having a frustratingly long encounter that you end up wiping on or one where you wipe the floor in a matter of a few rounds. Mistake number seven is using armor and weapons that you're not proficient with. So wearing armor that you're not proficient with will make your attack rolls and saving throws have disadvantage, meaning much more frustration for you. And also, if you're a spellcaster wearing armor that you're not proficient with, it'll prevent you from being able to cast spells. 
Headgear, gloves, and boots may also have certain armor type labels, and it can be very easy to equip gloves or boots on a character without noticing that those gloves or boots may be a type of armor that your character is not proficient with. If you're wearing something that you're not proficient with, when you scroll over that piece of gear at the bottom of its description, it will tell you in an orangish yellow writing that you're not proficient with that piece of gear. You can also look under your character sheet for a full list of your proficiencies. For weapons, when you're using a weapon that you're not proficient with, you don't get access to that weapon's specific skills. But even more importantly, your proficiency bonus will not be added to your attacks with that weapon, meaning that you're much more likely to miss. Mistake number eight is not using your weapon skills. So each weapon type in this game comes with its own unique weapon skills. Maces get concussive smash, great swords and great axes get cleave, crossbows get brace, and so on. To see what your weapon skills are, you can hover over your weapon and press T, and then move your cursor over these weapon icons underneath where it says proficiency with this weapon type unlocks. You can also press K, look under the common tab, and there is weapon actions. Some of your weapon actions can actually be really powerful, such as cleave with the great sword, which allows you to hit multiple enemies with a single strike. There's also several weapon actions that cost a bonus action to use. Pommel Strike, for example, doesn't do much damage, but it costs a bonus action. And if you already did your action on your turn and you have an opponent that still has, you know, one or two hit points left, you may actually be able to finish them off in that same turn with Pommel Strike. Weapon attacks recharge on a short rest, so you can't use them over and over and over again in a single round of combat, but not using them at all, I would say, is a mistake. Your weapon actions will all be represented under the common column on your hotbar. And this can be a little cluttered, so they can be easy to miss, but they are there and they are ready to be used. Mistake number nine is not taking advantage of the environment. If you're someone who struggles with combat, many times you can greatly ease this struggle simply by using the environment around you. Having ranged characters standing on high ground above opponents will give them a plus two to their attack rolls, making them much more likely to hit. Shooting down hanging concrete blocks may insta-kill some opponents on the battlefield. Shooting down burning braziers and chandeliers, breaking ladders so enemies can't climb up to you. Shooting fire wine barrels with fire spells to cause massive explosions. Using a lightning spell on an opponent that's standing in water. Shooting and then using the rest of your movement speed to get your character behind cover using the environment. There's so many opportunities that the environment gives you in Baldur's Gate 3 and taking advantage of these opportunities will make your combat life 10x easier. Mistake number 10 is never using your inspiration points. Once again, like many of these other ones, do whatever you want to do, but do note that the max amount of inspiration points that you can have at one time is four points, and that is shared across your entire party. For those who may be unaware, inspiration points are earned by doing things in the game that represent your character's background. So if you're a criminal, you may get an inspiration point for pickpocketing an NPC or something similar to that. These inspiration points can be used to re-roll the die when you're in a skill check. So something might not go as planned and you can actually try again by spending an inspiration point or spending all of your inspiration points and trying over and over again up to a max of four times as the max amount of points that you can have is four. Now, I'm not saying that you should spend your points in every failed skill check because you do want to have some for the more important moments, but I would say that spending a point or two here and there when you've already reached the four point maximum, even if it's a skill check that isn't insanely important, will do you more good than holding on to four at all times, because if you do that, you're basically not allowing the game to ever give you any more inspiration points, and therefore you're wasting a lot of inspiration points. You can see your inspiration points in the top right of your party view, which you can get to by hitting tab, or if you hit I on an individual character, you can see your points displayed above that character's inventory. Pressing P will also bring you to the inspiration points interface. Mistake number 11 is always keeping your party grouped together. Don't be afraid to scout ahead with a character or two, or maybe even a familiar. If you end up in combat with the scouting character, when they're in combat, when it's their turn, the game world is paused for them as long as they don't end their turn, and this gives you all the time in the world to then sneak up the rest of your party, put them in an advantageous position, and then jump into combat to save the character that was scouting ahead. On the same subject, when you're in combat, 
spreading out a little bit so that everyone's not on top of each other will make it so that when opponents use AoE attacks and spells on you, they won't be able to hit as many of your characters in one turn. Simply walking one character around to the backside of an opponent and having the other character in the front can reduce a lot of potential incoming damage. Mistake number 12, and this is pretty much for any CRPG in existence, is not using focus fire, as not using it can make battles much longer and much more brutal than they need to be. You don't always need to attack a single opponent with all four party members, but making sure that you actually kill targets and take them off the battlefield will make a huge difference. If you slowly peck away at your own targets with each character, it takes much longer to actually eliminate foes. And well, an opponent wizard with one hit point is still a wizard that can cast fireball and wipe your entire group. Taking opponents completely off the chessboard is typically much more important than overall damage being dealt. So don't be afraid to shoot firebolt at a target, then shoot a ranged sneak bow attack with your rogue at that same target and then smash your hammer into that same target with your fighter. You're going to actually get kills much quicker this way and the total damage that your party members will be receiving from opponents will be reduced drastically. Mistake number 13 is not using short rests. So don't forget that you have short rests that will replenish half of your hit points and also some of your class and weapon features such as warlock spell slots and those weapon specific skills that we talked about earlier. You get two short rests per one long rest. So if you took a little damage in an encounter but nothing too crazy, you don't really feel like going back to camp and using up camp supplies, hit that short rest button. There's no sense in using up valuable potions or spell slots for heals when you have a much less costly option available. On the same subject, you can always take a partial rest, which doesn't require camp supplies. But with that said, you do have to go back to your camp to do a partial rest and go through the process, which can be a little time consuming. Mistake number 14 is not using F5 to quick save. In Baldur's Gate 3, auto saves can be a bit spaced out, and I'm sure that many of you will find yourself wiping in an encounter or needing to go back to a previous load point for whatever reason, only to find out that you're now an hour plus back, and with the RNG nature of Baldur's Gate 3, it's not even guaranteed that you can get back to where you initially were. F5 is your best friend in this game. Press it before combat begins, and I'd say press it a time or two during an encounter as well, especially if things are going as planned. If you didn't know this, if you go into your settings, go under gameplay, and then look under the save options, you can actually increase the maximum number of auto saves and quick saves to 50, and I'd recommend doing that. And lastly is mistake number 15, and I think this one is a very common mistake, and that is not taking advantage of or understanding reactions in this game. Reactions can be a little confusing, and it's also easy to not even know that they exist. So in a round of combat, each character gets to use an action, a bonus action, and a reaction. Unlike actions and bonus actions, reactions occur when something specific triggers them, and this trigger most of the time will occur when it's not even that player's turn in combat. If you press K and then go to the Reactions tab, you can see the list of reactions that your character currently has access to. My ranger right here has Paralyzing Critical, Opportunity Attack, and Missile Snaring. If we take a look at missile snaring, it says reduce damage from a ranged weapon by 1d10 plus your dexterity modifier. I got this reaction from some magical gloves that I purchased from a vendor in the Druid's Grove. This reaction can be really powerful, and many times it will actually negate incoming ranged weapon damage to my character down to zero, so take no damage at all. Checking the box on the left right here will turn this reaction on, meaning that it's ready to go if an enemy lands a ranged weapon shot on my character. If I want missile snaring to automatically go off when this happens, I need to make sure that the ask box over here on the right is unchecked. So if a ranged weapon attack hits my character, behind the scenes the damage of that attack will be reduced and combat goes on. I didn't have to do anything at all and I might not even have noticed that it went off, but I still had the benefit of that reduced damage. Now if I want the game to pause and give me a pop-up box in the exact moment when my character is hit by a ranged weapon, then I need to also check the ask box. Sometimes you may want to actually have a pop-up box appear because some reactions are more costly than others, such as the reaction spells, shield and counter spell, which cost your caster a spell slot to use. 
He may not always be willing to give up a spell slot, so having the game ask you with a pop-up box when a trigger occurs, as opposed to your spells just auto going off, it can be a really useful feature. So make sure you look at what reactions that you have available, check the appropriate boxes, and then your characters will be taking advantage of a very powerful reaction system full of powerful abilities and spells. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you learned anything, let me know down below in the comments. And also, if you have any tips of your own to offer the community, put those down below in the comments as well. And I'll catch you on the next one.